Kunaka and welcome to the State of the Fijian. Today we'll be studying the indigenous issues in the country and how it affects national policy. With us today, a person who speaks mostly about indigenous issues and always outspoken on it, we have Honorable Nikonoi Kula, a member of parliament. Bulunaka, Mr. Nawikula. Bulunaka. So, Mr. Nawikula, everyone knows you're a champion of indigenous rights. In fact, you're always speaking on the issue. Uh -huh. um, and as such, the very first question I'd like to ask then is, uh, are you a nationalist? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for, uh, first for inviting me here. And uh, thank you to all who are listening to hear my views. Uh, the first question that you've asked is that I'm a nationalist and, uh, well, I'm totally not. I am a advocate of human rights. Uh, by that, I mean, when you talk of indigenous issues, or indigenous rights, we are basically speaking of human rights. Uh, human rights or what we term as group rights. Uh, individual or fundamental rights uh, uh, concern the respect and integrity of a person, whereas indigenous rights uh, relate to the respect and the need to protect the identity or cultural identity of a group of person in this case, indigenous as a group. So when you talk of indigenous rights, you are basically uh, speaking about their human rights. And that, uh, I, I must say that now, uh, academics, as well as experts, uh, have come to uh, understand and recognize that uh, you know, indigenous right is, in fact, uh, group rights. And uh, as they are based on two uh, UN instruments, uh, namely the ILOC 169 or the International Labour Organization 169 or the other one uh, that we normally refer to is the 2007 UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. Also known as UN DRIP. Also known as UN DRIP. Well, I ask this because um, John M. Balin Rokka in his paper mm -hmm. stated that uh, this uh, issue of nationalism or ethno-nationalism takes root in Fijian history. Mm -hmm. And uh, as such, this uh, came into fruition when uh, we had our own um, organizations and such built up for the Fijian identity, or the, sorry, indigenous identity, the indigenous peoples, that is. One such uh, organization is the GCC. Mm. Right. So you have been very outspoken on your support of the GCC and it's being brought back. In fact, uh, you set up the, you're one of those that set up the Fiji Native uh, Tribal Congress. Mm -hmm. Now, was the Fiji Native Tribal Congress an attempt mm -hmm. to bring back the GCC? Okay, let me just go back to, uh, to the, the first uh, statement you said, uh, uh, making the reference that uh, uh, indigenous right basically in Fiji has started off with uh, ethno-nationalism. Mm -hmm. I think uh, that is totally the wrong word to use. Uh, what we should uh, give credit to uh, Fijian history, especially in relation to the chiefs, is their recognition of their group rights, which are now being recognized in UNDRIP and ILOC 169. They have recognized that in terms of Fiji from the deed of session. And if you look at the deed of session, there were two basic uh, group rights that are now universally recognized for every indigenous people, which is their right to customary land and their right to cultural autonomy. And if I can even refer you further to the uh, deed of session, these are contained in clause four and clause seven. And if you look at the deed of session, the basic reason for the deed of session is the desire by the chiefs to protect their rights and interests rights and interests which are now recognized as human rights. Their rights to customary land and their rights to their cultural autonomy. So totally wrong to be saying ethno-nationalism. And the correct reference to say is that they were concerned about their rights and integrity of a people and their cultural identity in relation to their land and to their way of living, cultural autonomy. And those were the reasons and those were the only reasons why they entered into a deed 
which we call the deed of session, with one purpose and one purpose only. To allow the foreign ruler, in that case, the, uh, the crown, to come and rule Fiji with the primary purpose of protecting their rights. And there are two which were recognized there under Clause 4 and Clause 7, their rights to customary land and their rights to their cultural autonomy. So uh, in answer to that, uh, wrong to say nationalist, but the right word to say is that they were concerned about their rights and interests, and that were the purpose of them entering into their deed of session. But then, if you keep referring to the deed of session, mm -hmm. isn't that a colonialistic document that bound the people, indigenous people, to another set of laws? Well, it's, it's totally wrong to say that it's, uh, it's a colonial. What is colonial? What is independent? It's an instrument. Uh, it's the, the correct way to, to, to look and assess is that it was an instrument for the protection of the indigenous people of this country by the crown at the time. So that was the whole purpose. And now coming to your uh, question on the GCC, whether uh, the concern, you know, one of the primary concern of the GCC is, uh, you know, it, it, it's about our whole identity. And as I say, indigenous rights is totally about the right to maintain your cultural identity your cultural ethnicity. And uh, uh, those are now being uh, recognized in the in new independent law C-169, which is basically the right for indigenous people, whoever they are, whether they be Maori, whether they be uh, uh, Native Americans, mm. whether they be Aborigines, to maintain their cultural institution. Thank you very much for that, uh, Mr. Noe Kula. Uh -huh. Please, um, don't go away. We, we will be right back with you after this break with more on issues of indigeneity. Welcome back to the State of Fijian with Mr. Nico Nawekula. Mr. Nawekula, just um, in the last segment, you shared about how um, human rights and indigenous rights exist in tandem with each other. And this is very interesting because we often hear any issues or any indigenous uh, issue being touted as uh, racist. But uh, do you think that with the erosion or with the abolition of the GCC, which is also said to be a uh, racist uh, organization, do, do you think that this would also erode other Itoki values? Okay, let me start with the definition of racism. Mm. Racism means to deny or prefer a person on the basis of his race or ethnicity. And your question is, if we advocate human rights, for example, to maintain and protect the Great Council of Chiefs, would that be racist? Well, the answer to that is no. It's a clear no. And the clear no, and I can tell you that uh, I went to Geneva to submit before the Human Rights Committee for the uh, elimination of all forms of racial discrimination in 2012, submitting to them a totality of about 23 anti-Tauke laws. Mm. By anti-Tauke laws, I mean the laws that have been passed by this government that are in breach of indigenous Fijians, uh, indigenous rights. For example, their right to maintain their cultural institution. For example, their right to prior and informed consent before any laws is passed that affects them. And as I say, there are 23 uh, totality of laws that are in breach of those. Now, when I submitted to the uh, Human Rights Commission, the conclusion in relation to the termination of the Great Council of Chiefs is that it is a racist act by this government. Why? Because it attempts to remove their rights and indigenous people the right being to maintain their cultural autonomy on the basis of their race and ethnicity. So, the complete opposite of that. When you remove the right of a person as a group, for example, in this case, the Great Council of Chiefs, that becomes a racist act. So maintaining that is totally different. And then I said, if you maintain that, uh, it, it does not become racist. Because that is there, recognized, as I say, under the UNDIP and ILO 69 as a necessary right for the indigenous people 
to protect them for their own integrity and to protect them for their cultural identity. So uh, the, the simple answer to your question is that removing the Greek Council of Chiefs is a racist act, but maintaining it is a recognition of the rights of uh, uh, the indigenous people of this country. And you can move further from there. You know, uh, uh, in the future, okay, mm. uh, the challenge for the government is to recognize that and to uh, apportion or balance that with the rights of the others. So in the future, you might be looking at, which is what I will also be like to be looking at, a great council of chiefs that's not only peopled by the chiefs, the traditional chiefs, but also senior, senior elders of all other communities. Mm. In which case, the Greek Council of Chiefs will become very uh, you know, inclusive. It's not, it will not only be for the indigenous people, but it will also be as it was. And I recognize it was in the time of Ratumar. You know, they were not only chiefs for indigenous people, they were chiefs for all people who rightfully call Fiji their home. Indigenous, Indo-Fijians, Kailom, and everyone. The chiefs were for them. So mm. that was that to me is the way forward, mm. as opposed to terminating it, which is also a very racist act. Not my word, but by the word of the uh, Human Rights Commission. Thank you for that. Now, um, this, we now come to the policy segment of our show. And in this segment, we'd like to uh, show you something that was uh, a statement made by the Prime Minister in 2015 at the, when he presented in Geneva. He made a statement regarding the indigenous issues in Fiji and how it's different from all other countries. Uh, stark contrast to other countries such as Australia and USA, for example, the colonial experience in Fiji was not one of large-scale dispossession of land and rights and marginalization of the indigenous people. Today, approximately 91% of all land in Fiji is owned through customary ownership by the indigenous people and cannot be permanently alienated under any circumstances. This has given the indigenous people a level of security that has been noticeably absent in other countries and has been central to their social and economic well-being. Well, I listen to that and I laugh. I laugh because, you know, <clears throat> it demonstrates that uh, <clears throat> our Prime Minister, with the greatest respect to him, has been very ill-informed and not properly advised. Oh, so. Now, he compares Fiji to uh, the Maoris and the Americans and the Aborigines. No, you can't compare those because uh, in those countries, uh, the indigenous people of those countries were totally disregarded or their rights totally annihilated. Uh, uh, they, they lost their culture. They lost their language. Not Fiji. Because as I have told you before, in Fiji, what the chiefs did was as opposed to the Maoris or to the uh, Red Indians who fought against the white settlers. The chiefs of Fiji went to a greater authority, namely the Crown, and signed a deed for the protection of their rights. And the Prime Minister is true that here, their rights to land have been recognized. Their rights to, they had the, the cultural, uh, uh, the greatest cultural uh, uh, body, the, the GCC was recognized. And the reason for that was because the, 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 the colonial uh, administrator at the time, the Crown, chose to recognize that on the basis of the deed of session. As opposed, so you cannot compare that with uh, the American Indians. And two, uh, we have 91% of the land because of that. But that is not the reason to be removing it or terminating all those rights. So the, the, the irony is, whereas the whole of uh, uh, the international community are now recognizing indigenous rights, we in Fiji are removing it. We have terminated the Great Council of Chiefs. We have nationalized uh, their cultural autonomy, provincial councils. We have uh, interfered with and nationalized the administration of their native land. When in fact, what Fiji should be doing is to show the world this is the 
way to go. Mm -hmm. This is the way that it should be, which is you recognize the rights and interest and you balance it with the rights of other communities. Thank you very much, Mr. Nawekula. Um, we'll be back for more with uh, Honorable Nawekula on issues of indigeneity in Fiji. Welcome back to the State of the Fijian with Mr. Nawekula. Um, Mr. Nawekula, we have spoken about the return of the GCC in the last few segments right. in trying to return them, but do you think that um, chiefs should be in politics? Well, uh, uh, the answer there, you know, uh, politics is open to every individual, whether you are a chief or whatever. And uh, <coughs> Uh, for anyone, chiefs or commoner, who feel the need to serve uh, in the public, for example in parliament, you know, th there's no stopping. But the thing is that once you, you know, the values of, uh, there are <coughs> expectations that are required, uh, you know, being a public figure, especially in parliament. And uh, those are the things that, uh, you know, anyone, chiefs or commoner, become equal. So basically, in <coughs> Parliament, uh, Parliament is equal ground. You cannot take. Would mm. you agree with the statement that you cannot take your rank into Parliament? Yeah, correct. Because it's a uh, it's it, it's a it's a uh, house for the uh, for the common people where uh, issues of national interest are delegated for public debate, mm. and there are rules that, that guide that. So we are subject equally, chiefs of commoner, to the same rules of debate and. Uh, and the, and the values of a parliament. Mm. We also spoke about the erosion of uh, values in Fiji. One such value, I believe, is naming, uh, w issues with naming, where one person might have one name on the birth certificate but be known by a different name, an issue I know that you're all too familiar with. What do you uh, think about the current uh, changes in laws? Well, it's a very, you know, laws. It's a very bad law. It's a very foolish law. And I don't think uh, it will be judged in relation to that in history. Take, for example, <coughs> if my wife, uh, my wife is Mili, and now under the new laws, uh, the law will only recognize him by a birth certificate name. And that will, uh, that will, that, that will force her, using my name, to change her birth certificate. But in culture, you know, my name it's a different values and perspective in relation to identity. No one can just use it like that. Uh, that's where the foolishness of the law will reveal itself. You know, uh, wives, for example, who take the, uh, the names of their husband. Before, you didn't have to change your birth certificate. Now, you have to change your birth certificate. But that is totally wrong. Because the husband's name, you know, refers to a lineage. You know, and, and he doesn't even own it. So, whereas before, <coughs> she can have, or women can have their own names, and uh, add the names of their, of their husband, you know, as alias or also known as. That's okay, because uh, to, add the, to add that name, uh, you don't add it to the, to the birth secret. But now that you add it to the birth secret, you are totally confusing uh, what goes with the name. So, so I hope, I hope, uh, well, we will change it. When we win government, uh, we will go back to the, and it's unfortunate that uh, the government has uh, to use me uh, as an example. And very sadly, quite wrongly too, government announced that it was doing it uh, to make uh, elections uh, fair. And then it changed its mind again, because if they are now doing, correcting uh, by that, to make uh, elections free and fair, it would mean that the elections of 2014 were not free and fair. Mm. So, uh, you know, the foolishness of the government uh, reveals itself by that. Mr. Oikula, we will now be going into the public, what we call the public hot seat, where mm. we field questions from the public. <coughs> okay. So, first up we have Sivo. Mr. Oikula. Over the last few years, you've been one of the most vocal advocates for the 
for the Itake people and what you believe they deserve as the indigenous people of Fiji. In saying that, one can also surmise that despite your best efforts, forward progress within the space of the empowerment of the Itake population has been lethargic at best. What could you as a member of parliament, with everything that you've done, have actually done better to garner more traction and support amongst your colleagues, members of opposition, and the powers that be within government with regards to the Itake empowerment and the physical manifestation of it? Well, uh, in answer, let, let me just uh, say that in relation to the indigenous issues that I advocate, mm -hmm. for Fiji, the challenge for Fiji and the issue for Fiji is different from Australia, is different from the US, is different from uh, 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 the Aborigines. In many of those countries, indigenous people are minority. Mm. In Fiji, they are not. So the challenge for Fiji is you recognize indigenous rights, and the challenge is how to balance it. How to balance it with the, uh, with the rights of other communities. Please. An example of the balancing act was the establishment of the Native Land Trust Board, where government recognizing the need of the indigenous people for their connection to their cultural connection, and also the need of other communities you know, establish the Native Land Trust Board for a primary reason, to allow every individual, every citizen, equality of access mm -hmm. to land. And how it does that was that the Act demarcated land into a reserve that is specifically and exclusively used by indigenous Fijians, and outside of reserve, where we have equality of access. Whether you are Fijian, Chinese, Kailoma, or indo Fijian, same. Uh, so, so, so that was one, uh, uh, th that's the way forward for us, how we balance it. And uh, uh, going back to the, uh, to the question, the question I was asking, I have been advocating and uh, it seems like somehow uh, we are not properly empowered, so what do you do? Uh, you know, <clears throat> when you talk of human rights, human group rights or human rights, it's permanent and inalienable. Mm. It does not die. You can stamp on it, but it will come up. So for, for me, uh, it doesn't really, I don't really care whether I don't achieve uh, the restoration of the indigenous rights and the balancing of those rights in my lifetime. So long as I inform and I keep informed. And, that, and what I've been doing, you know, sometimes I feel that uh, I am like a lone voice in parliament, uh, uh, not being heard. Uh, it doesn't really matter. As long as I pass on the information so that people who are younger, can take that on. And, uh, you know, in their lifetime, they'll bring it up. I'll mm -hmm. be happy. I'm gone, but I'll be happy. Uh, our second question comes from a young lady. Yes. <clears throat> As a woman, my Matangali does not allow me any ownership of land, even though I contribute to the Vanua financially and all. Do you think women ought to be accorded these rights? And should our children also inherit if their father is not in the picture? Yes, uh, you know, it's a matter of discussion, you know culture and custom progress. And I'm hoping that in time, not only male, but also female, will have the right to cultural, cultural land. Mm. And there are communities where we can seek examples, you know, in the Banabans, they are matrilineal. So uh, I'm hoping, you know, uh, with time, uh, 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 gender issues are becoming pro more prevalent. And, uh, you know, the recognition of the right of the, uh, of the, of the female uh, you know, to, to the ownership of land will come. And uh, there are examples of where it has happened, you know. Mm. I'm saying that I'm hoping that it will come, but it's never come. But, you know, if you look back at history, you now one issue then was the, the, the children of the, you know, the, uh, the children out of wedlock. And in their own wisdom, uh, they were recognized and recognized with their mother. So that's an example of how custom and tradition progress with time. And it is my hope that, uh, you know, in the future, uh, that will also be recognized fully for members of the Matangali. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Noe Kula. And we wish we could uh, listen and uh, stay for more, but unfortunately, time has caught up with us. And uh, we'd like to take this time to thank you, Mr. Noe Kula, for agreeing to be part of this show. And uh, to everyone who's uh, watching at home, please do join us next week as we will talk more about the state of the Fijian. Mm -hmm.